Andy Austin here up in the attic with the seagulls above my head, which you may be able to hear shortly as they start shouting at each other. Next chapter from The Rainbow Machine, Tales from a Neurolinguist's Journal. Now this chapter review is the one on Right Man Syndrome. Now Right Man Syndrome, I think, was one of those chapters that was more interesting to me in the response that it got than it was in developing the chapter. This, when this book was published, the amount of correspondence that I received from, from readers was astonishing. I wasn't really expecting very much, to be honest. I knew it was a good book, but I wasn't expecting the kind of feedback that I got. And the Right Man Syndrome chapter was the one that got the feedback. The rest of it didn't. It was this chapter. What was interesting was just how many people wrote to me to say, you've described my father, you've described my husband, you've described my son, you've described my brother, you described my boss. Basically, you have described perfectly a person that I am connected to. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Now, amongst those emails, I also got, and from people I know in the real world, I also got people say, you wrote that on me, didn't you? Or you wrote that on my husband, you wrote that on such and such. No, it isn't. What I got right was an, a number of the patterns in the right, I got a, a collection of these patterns, I put them together, and clearly I hit a fairly good archetype. Because when people are so accurately identifying what I've written here and the examples that I've used, and they say that is X or that is me that you're talking about, and that's not nice, that kind of stuff, I think, yeah, I got that, I got that right. So I was, quite, I was quite pleased with that response, but it also was a bit awkward because when I had people that I know essentially accusing me of turning them into a chapter of the book, it's like, no. But of course, that's a pattern of narcissism. It's, you're always talking about them. Everything's always about them. When I wrote the chapter and sent this over to Steve Andreas for editing, I wasn't I wasn't familiar with narcissism at all. And to be fair, it was Steve that said, Oh, this is this is a description of a form of narcissism, or these are narcissistic traits. I didn't really look into it a little bit more than that. This year, after my own first hand experience with a narcissist last year, I've been making quite a more in depth study uh, through some of the channels I've referenced previously. Predominantly people like Sam Wagner, Professor Ramini and Les Carter. And so I've learned a lot more, which is probably why in other videos I keep referencing narcissism, narcissism because it's a, it's a main study for me at this time. What I want to do is to go through some of these, um, some of these um, patterns just for, for purposes of the video and also just give you some additional data. And I also have the rebuke that I subsequently wrote to this particular chapter. So this video is going to be a bit longer than the others. Just to give you an idea of how I came up with these patterns, this was based around conversations with other coaches and therapists and healthcare professionals. And I was collecting information on the impossible patient, the client who arrives and you can't do anything. Whatever you do, it simply, you just don't make any progress. The impossible client. And I, I wanted to gather as much data on those clients as possible and find out what did they all have in common. And so this, this bit of work went over quite a long period of time and lots of conversations and lots of session reviews, lots of audio tape and videotape analysis of sessions as well, both my own, but also secondhand reports from, from other clinicians. And bit by bit, I started to, to gather these patterns together. So these are the patterns that when displayed in a therapeutic setting, tend to defeat the therapist or coach. And it doesn't really matter what the setting is. The, the, the client's not going to change their behaviors. That's how this started out. Then as the, when this was published, um, more data started coming in because, okay, so I'm seeing this in a clinical setting. But of course, what we can now see is how people have relationships with people who have these behaviors too. How people may have these, one of these people may be a parent, it may be another relative, it might be a husband or, you know, a husband or wife and so on. I do think, I do think these patterns are probably more male patterns than they are female patterns. Sorry, guys, but this, these, these do reek of male behaviors. Um, I certainly haven't, I can't think of any women that I've seen display all of these patterns. Right, let's go through them. Right, pattern number one is there's no shades of gray. And essentially what this is doing is forcing you to pick between black or white. When it's neither of those things. It's something else. Choose. I had a I had an experience uh, last year through social media when I had the 
loony progressive liberal left hate mob the virtue hate mob on facebook go after me because i made some ambiguous joke about something rather and i'd used the wrong ideology oh my goodness am i in big big trouble so i had the hate mob turn on me and what was interesting was that some of the, the the behavioral strategies that that were given the leader of this little pack he's he, his message was fantastic so you're a trump supporter it's like well uh, i'm british and i i don't actually vote <laughs> sorry guys um so no and I've never donated to the Republican Party or to Trump's campaign, so I don't think I'm a Trump supporter. Well, deny it then. Say you're not a Trump supporter. So I thought, now, immediately now, to be forced to deny something, that's, that now is a setup. Because if I, if I start playing the game, they've got one over on me, and I'm now doing what they tell me to do. And if I refuse to play the game, then I'm clearly in the, the guilty, guilty bracket of whatever it is they want to accuse me of. So that is a very good example of the black and white. There is nothing out. There is no alternative between this option or this option. And in right man syndrome, when you're working with clients with this, when you're trying to get them to see the subtleties of human relationships, the subtleties of human experience. And let's face it, most people's suffering comes down to the, the, the presence of other people. How many problems something you may want to think of yourself how many of your problems would disappear if you were the last person on the planet if you had you know the fantasy most people have had where everyone is gone and you're the last person on earth how many of your problems would continue to exist and if they've all gone away all of those problems are about the relationships you have with other people and so with right man syndrome they're not able to comprehend the subtleties of the nature of relationships. And everything is basically this or it's that. And not everyone actually fits into those two categories that are decided by right man. Pattern number two, what I call the, the catastrophization and permanency. This is the you have ruined your life. And this is the overgeneralization of small level events that are then deemed to be devastating to your identity. So, again, if I go back to my progressive hate mob, virtue hate mob that I had, I made some ambiguous reference in a joke to an ideology they didn't like. And as a result of that, I am the worst human being on the planet. Now, you could have somebody, and we will see this on things like Twitter, you have a person who has led a really good life, they have done lots of stuff for other people, they have been really active in promoting various bits and pieces, they say one wrong thing, and that's it. They're clearly a racist, homophobe, phobe of everything you can possibly list, and therefore scum of the earth don't deserve to walk the planet. And it's extraordinary how we take the tiniest, tiniest detail and it gets catastrophized into identity level, you must be cancelled, cancel culture, and so on. It's quite a remarkable thing. And one of the things that is used as well by people, uh, they'll take things from the past. Again, an ambiguous thing from five years ago, six years ago, they might have said on Twitter, or a joke they made, or something. And that's it. doesn't matter. Take the tiniest detail and you've ruined your life. So this is another way it can it can manifest. Now the reason I'm using the liberal progressive hate mob as a as an example here is because right man syndrome typically would be the image of the patriarchal right wing man who's dominant. And of course we'll find the same patterns elsewhere if they they just get dressed up differently. And the person is about being right all the time. Pattern number three is I know you better than you know yourself. So this is the art of superior knowledge. And I will experience this fairly frequently in training. So when I'm running a teaching, it's, what happens more in London, actually, than it does in any other country. And I've, I've recognized that. And I know I've had colleagues refer to the same, same phenomena, where you have a person attend the training, and it doesn't appear that they're there to learn something new. They're there to prove something to themselves and to the audience as they say, well, are you saying that blah, 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 and I never said such a thing? Or they will say, well, so where's your evidence for that? Because blah, 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 and then they will contradict where I may be talking figuratively or giving a generalization and their position is constantly that of, well, so have you read Volt and have you read Fennell and, and Smith, 1943? 
You haven't? Why, why not? Well, so where did you do your psychology degree? And so what they'll do is they, they jump into a categorization of, well, you clearly don't know the stuff that I know. They'll throw out a vague reference. So, so did you did you train with John? Well, John who? Oh, don't you know John? You will get that kind of stuff too, and that's very common with the NLPers, where they use their their trainer's first name when there's multiple people with that first name, and they would say it as though, well, well, John. Oh, of course, of course. You know, I, I trained with David back in '54. Yes, yes. It's like wow. And you get a lot of that in the NLP world. I've got to say, that's where I see it <laughs> see it the most. So essentially, I, I have superior knowledge, but right man uses it on you. They'll actually have superior knowledge of you. So you might have said something, you might have um, explained something, and the person is capable of completely dismissing that because they know what you really mean. And I didn't mean that, nor did I say it. Yeah, yeah, but I know. It's all right. I, I understand. I know. And they, they, they hold it. They hold it constant. I never said that. I never hinted it. But they make it. And in some people, you might even have relatives that do this. And I've had clients tell me they have parents that do this, which is you're, you say something, the parent gets it completely wrong. You try and correct them, and they, they just completely ignore your correction. They're just quite satisfied with the conclusion they've just jumped to. And then act as though that's completely true, change the subject and move on. And the person is left devastated because like, well, I tried to explain and no one listened to me. And they happens again and again and again, and it becomes a recurring theme, which now says you, the child, the adult child, whatever, your identity, what you say is irrelevant. And I don't need to listen to you because I know you better than you know yourself. I don't need you to explain to me. And I don't need you to try and change my mind because I already know, I already know you better than you know yourself. So it's quite common with parents because they've seen your growth from birth and so they feel that they have better knowledge of you and they may not at all of course they may have had that misconception your entire life and they don't get it they're never going to listen to any correction from you because they don't need to because when you try and correct them they already know and you're wrong anyway so what does it matter when you've got that pattern and especially if you're dealing with a client who displays that pattern um, that is really problematic to deal with. And I've got to say, the best thing you can do, show them the door. Um, right, pattern number four, I'm doing this for your benefit, acts of selfless duty. I love this one. So some of the examples that, that came up were, again, I'm sorry, guys, but it is the men. When guys do things for women that the women didn't want, they buy them ridiculous presents that they couldn't possibly... Like, what the hell? What If you knew me, what would you be buying that for me for? And they, they force help and assistance upon people that don't want it. And that's... Uh, women do complain about that quite a bit. There was a... Mansplaining was a, was a thing um, a year or so ago. I think that's died out as a fashion now. But I think it had a point because I've seen people do this. It's like, what are you doing? Just leave them. But they're doing it for your benefit. So ultimately now this is because you need it. And so right man to a degree is deciding what you do and don't need. They're also deciding what you are and who you are because they've already, they already know you better than you know yourself. They will use any, any slight flaw that they detect in you as evidence that you are worthless and therefore probably need of their assistance because you can ruin your life and everything's black and white so to try and reason with them is impossible so accumulatively just these four patterns alone are hugely problematic all right pattern number five trapped by your own words now i love this one because one of the things about right man behaviors they always appear like they're not listening they always like it's like, it's like talking to a brick wall they always appear like they're not listening and yet years later weeks later days later or hours later they will use something you've said perfectly back against you when they've detected that you've contradicted yourself so one of the things about narcissists generally and and right man syndrome if it is a pattern of narcissism they're very good at using evidence against of you against yourself and listening for contradictions they're also astute lie detectors 
which is ironic because they lie constantly themselves and are incapable of telling the truth about anything, yet they are incredibly attuned and incredibly sensitive to detecting deceptions and lies and contradictions. And oh boy, they will happily use contradictions against you. It is quite phenomenal. Now, as again, as a trainer, I have people do this to me because because I, th I think I have a very high level of figurative speaking. So an awful lot of what I say is not true. And yesterday, I've got to say, the video I put up, what was it about? Um, on the members section, hit the join button, you'll, you can access the videos. I realized that I'd contradicted in telling the story of the lady who asked me if I was her father, when clearly I would, couldn't be her father. And I hadn't, I'd forgotten that I'd actually written that in the book. Now, the story I told on the video versus the story that was told in the book uh, don't actually match. And I thought, now that's going to be interesting. Let's see who calls me up on that one. Both the stories are are based on truth. It was a real event, but the retelling of the story is largely figurative, mostly through retelling and error creeps in with repeated retellings. And ego dresses it up to be far more heroic and also right man syndrome, the sufferer, right man syndrome person will detect that and will basically utilize that as evidence of contradiction. And they will then immediately jump to pattern number two, which is catastrophization. And, and then you basically hold that against you. So if that's not true, everything you have said and everything you ever say is completely not true. So there's an overgeneralization into the issue of contradiction, deception and lies. And they put that out there. Now, because you can't explain because everything's black and white, either it's true or it's not, it, 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 it can't be both it's either true or it's not true so which is it to be um once you're in that bond the rule of permanency which is part of number two is invoked and now i've decided what you are therefore you never need to explain anything to me because i've decided and a leopard never changes his spots oh my god now you're up against this in trying to have a rational normal linguistic chat <laughs> good luck good luck with this one right pattern number six the end of the matter, finalization. Now, this is one of those ones, I think this was one of the first patterns I started to recognize. And it was how the right man shuts down conversation and debate. Because they have to be right, and because they have all these other patterns, which at the time I, I of identifying this one wasn't aware of, they can't allow you to have a conversation that is both reasonable and proves them to be wrong. So they have to end the conversation. The more socially adept right man will simply change the subject. Um, and some, some will have high levels of social sophistication and can do that and control the agenda in conversation. But others will go, well, that's the end of the matter. I'm not going to discuss this further. Full stop, period. Drawing a line under the issue. I've drawn a line in the sand. I will not discuss this further. You will not discuss this further. They go into all of these kinds of things. And what I started to, what I, the pattern I recognized was how common that was because I thought it was just me experiencing those things from other people because of my personality aggravating those those personalities. And it turns out that actually this is quite common. Um, and in the correspondence that I had after this was published, a lot of people did actually report that is the very thing they had identified themselves. I have spoken. This will be the end of the matter. We will not discuss this further. Okay. But what would happen if I wanted to discuss it further? Can we discuss it further and watch what happens next? Holy shit. Explosion. And the other thing is the, the, the physical language. So there'll be a banging of the fist, a pointy finger. There might be this gesture. I never quite understood that one. That's an interesting one. I think that's generational. Um, there may well be the, the, the sigh, the tension, and is it the gloved fist, the velvet fist? Anyway, where you've got a tight fist and then a soft hand massaging it and you'll see that often and then they get pulled apart uh, often slammed down on the table or the chair arms or whatever and watch for the the tightened fist and the, the relaxed hand that massages it it's, mm, half of them is angry half of them is trying to calm themselves down that's how i interpret that but body language experts out there may know better comment section below pattern number seven i'm warning you indicators of violent threats now this is this i took this from from bateson which is, he says the nip in puppies the nip denotes the bite but does do not note that denoted by the bite <laughs> so the nip denotes the bite but it's not what is communicated by the bite so it's play 
Now, if I'm talking to you pointing my finger with a scowl, right, the, the finger denotes the fist, but it's not the fist. So it doesn't denote what's denoted by the fist. It's just a pointy finger. But it's a hint. It's a warning. I'm warning you. The tension in the face, the tone of voice, the gritting of the teeth, grrr, those kind of things um, may well be the, um, indicators of violent threats. Now, by using indicators of violent threats, I'm not threatening you. So I get to claim that when you start becoming intimidated or whatever, well, that's just evidence of your weakness. When you start backing off, that's evidence of me being right, as well as your weakness and so forth. And so essentially, the indicators of violent threats are the things that enable me to retain my virtue position and blame you for the reaction that you have to them, which is fantastic. That pointy finger. And the other one, I love this one. Um, when I went to the business networking groups, I spent a year, uh, when I was learning business stuff, I spent a year going to as many business networking groups as I could. And I, I learned quite a few things about the kind of characters that go to those groups. And it's the bully boy. He's always got a, a, a nice suit, nice shirt, often got quite expensive aftershave. And, you know, it's in, it's in the evening, usually these meetings. And when he comes up, he he's, makes an enthusiastic handshake, which everyone gets to see because you can't just do a discreet little handshake. And hi, how are you doing? They have to make a display of it and crush that hand. Um, and somebody who has arthritis in his hands, that is hugely problematic to me. And I used to hate these people. Um, and they're everywhere. And what they're doing, of course, now is it's a secret. The whole thing about a handshake is what the actual transaction of the pressure that's exchanged is actually secret to everybody else. So I, what I can do if I'm the right man bully boy mentality, I can come in and shake your hand with all of the external gestures of friendly, upbeat, I'm a character, I'm a lot of fun, me, but at the same time what I'm doing is breaking your hand. And that is a, a secret way of communicating strength and dominance. And that's one of those little things, to, just the same as that, it's just dressed up to play to the audience of whoever else is there. Pattern number eight. Ask loaded questions, deny hidden agenda, and be offended if someone asks you why you are asking. Now this, I, I hadn't realized just how much this is a serious pattern of narcissism. Narcissism. Narcissists will do this quite a lot. So, so what are you doing tomorrow? You know, you know, you have to be busy. You know when the person asks you that, you don't want to be available for them. You know there's a manipulation coming up. What are you doing tomorrow? They don't say, I would benefit from some assistance tomorrow. Are you available to come give me a hand? They will do, what are you doing tomorrow? And if you go, ah, oh, not much. Oh boy, you're in trouble. Because now they've got you. Because what they can then say is, you know, they can keep asking you questions. So you're in an impossible position then to say no when they ask you to do the thing they want you to do or tell you to do the thing you want to do. Now, if you are now primed, so you know the person does those behaviors, you can then ask them, well, why are you asking? Well, I'm just asking. Don't be so defensive. What are you up to tomorrow? I just ask, I'll make an inquiry. They can then be all offended because all they're doing is just asking you about your weekend. But you know they're not. Of course they're not. They're asking a manipulative question. But they always get to play the virtue card afterwards. Get a lot of that. Um, and it's one of the things I think I'm particularly attuned to. Um, I was Even as a child, I was aware of it. Because I saw how boys especially were manipulative um, to control other people. Right, pattern number nine. Maintain one level of rapport whilst violating all other levels. And so this is one of those weird things, and I saw this a lot in the hospital um, with senior nurses who were, were bullies. They would maintain this kind of mollycoddling mentality, management by mothering, somebody called it, at the same time would violate all professional boundaries um, and everything else, and you would have no choice but to, oh, but she's so lovely, she doesn't mean it. And that's when you know you have someone who does these behaviours. When you have other people going, oh, it's okay, they don't mean it. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. Because what's happening is the negative element that's being violated is happening to you. It's not happening to them who's defending the right man. 
And so the defender of right man is failing to see the consequence of the right man's behavior. And so they'll defend them. And now in a workplace, that person may well be violating those boundaries with you, but nobody else. Violating a different set of things with that person and nobody else. And so they get to control and manipulate each of these individuals and simultaneously are defended by everyone else. Because what other people see and what the recipient receives isn't necessarily aligned with each other. And so these things can happen quite covertly. If you want to know more on how these things operate, you really want to look at those three channels of Sam Vaknin, Les Carter, and Dr. Ramini um, on YouTube, because they document these kind of phenomena incredibly in incredible detail. So it's well worth having a look at those things. Um, it's a huge problem um, when you need allies. Say it's a workplace situation, you can't walk away from that, and you want to have allies, and you can't find them. It's, it's a problem. Right, so that's those patterns. We reduced down to nine. I think we started off with 11 or 12. Now, I wrote a rebuke on Right Man because as I learned more after the, after it was published, I started to realize that actually these are the behaviors that are the patterns of success. Put yourself now in a position of high authority where you need to be a decision maker. You need to make things happen. You have to handle the consequences of when things don't happen correctly. You have multiple people below you who are pulling, trying to pull you and control you in different directions for their own agendas, but you're the ultimate decision maker. Now, you have a set of patterns that are actually required in order to be an effective leader and decision maker. So, you need to know when people are basically bullshitting you. You need to be able to use that and feed it back to them to make that stop. You need to know when people are telling you one thing but telling a colleague something else and vice versa and you need to be able to feed that back to people because in calling people on their own words that's a very effective way of maintaining organizational control or at least behavioral control for some of those those people to be able to put an end to the matter to make a decision which may impact some people negatively and not everyone's going to agree with the decision you need to be able to go that's the end of it this is happening regardless you need to have that you need to be able to make clear decisions and look at different options in order to decide rather than be locked into a shade of gray, so the black and white thinking. You need to know whether you can trust people. So the leopard never changes his spots, the catastrophization. If somebody is stealing from you, are you going to allow them to be promoted up the ranks as you know they've stolen? when they were younger if you know they were lying are you going to be because you are you're looking at longitudinal thing in time are you going to allow that person to, to remain in the organization probably not or it depends what so all of these patterns i'm doing this for your benefit sometimes that has to be the motivation even if the people don't agree i've certainly had things within where i've had little bits of organization that I've worked with where I have to implement things and I know I can see I see the bigger picture that by implementing this particular thing everything's going to improve for everybody but nobody likes change so then I've got to try and sell it to people I'm doing this for your own benefit or the organization is doing this for your own benefit and everyone's going well no you're not you're doing it for your benefit and so on we also need to have good understanding of if we know people know better than they know themselves so I may well have lots and lots of experience as a therapist and coach and somebody new may come along with great ambitions to be a therapist and coach and I can look at that person because I know the business, I know the scene, I know the techniques and methodologies and all the rest of therapy and coaching, I have a good indicator, I, I can tell whether they'll be any good or not. And in a weird way, I know them better than they know themselves at that moment in time because they don't know the bigger picture. So here's my point. All of the patterns of right man syndrome in the wrong context are every, every other person's worst nightmare. But in the right context are actually required for business and success and organizational leadership and so forth. That was something I hadn't accounted for at the time that I wrote this chapter. I hadn't realized just how much these patterns are in fact incredibly useful. The why, how do I know these things now? 
because I've had to develop some of these for myself in order to do some of the projects and things that I'm currently working on because I've realized, oh, being the nice guy, being seeing both sides of the argument and so forth doesn't really work in these contexts. I have to make decisions that impact people and so on. Now, I wrote a rebuke to myself here. So now if we call, we have right man, we also have maybe man. And those familiar with the IMT work that I developed will, will be aware of maybe man as a, as a concept. Now, this is the man who is unsure of his own experience. Now, maybe man, in pattern number one, there are no shades of gray. For him, maybe man, everything's a shade of gray. He'll try to do something. He might do something later. He'll probably get round to doing that. I think I might possibly get round to doing that sometime, maybe. Everything's a shade of gray. They don't like to have categories because this way they can change their mind at any given time. And also, black and white thinking requires a commitment to something an eternal shade of gray you never have to be committed to anything so maybe man lives in a whole world that's gray it's never black and white there are no distinct categories right pattern number two uh, which is basically the rule of permanency remembering how other people fail maybe man doesn't he simply doesn't he doesn't even remember how he fails this is how they're able to do the same patterns again and again and again and never actually get anywhere in life and are comp basically completely useless because they're never attributing consequence to anything they have done because everything's a shade of gray and nothing's ever permanent. They also have this other rule because nothing's ever permanent. They can just wait for things to change. They can be entirely passive to time rather than make things change. They can wait for things to change. They will eventually. Right. So you have ruined your life. When the maybe man says, sure, I'll try to remember to bring your book back tomorrow, only to state the following day, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Can he really be relied on for anything? Can he, can he actually do? For right man, identifying the small signs of failure and ineptitude enables him to identify the patterns of failure and to chunk it up and map across context. Again, how the person performs on the golf course or simply making the tea or eats marshmallows can reveal much about the man. Pattern number four. I know you better than you know yourself, so superior knowledge. Right man knows well that when maybe man says he might do something, he probably won't. He also knows that when maybe man says he might do something, maybe man actually believes that he will. In this scenario, right man really does know maybe man better than he knows himself. I'm only doing this for your benefit, acts of selfless duty. Unlike maybe man, right man possesses a strong sense of duty. When he says he'll do something, he will do it, even if the execution of the task is rendered difficult or goes unappreciated by the other person. Thus, right man is often found in high pressure, high stress jobs and careers where there is little thanks and little gratitude. Few others would tolerate or put up with the pressures willingly. Right man's sense of selfless duty enables him to place responsibility into a frame that enables him to endure where other people's will, other people wilt and fail. Right, so just desserts, trapped by your own words. The right man is adept at tracking another, another speaker's words and will look for the slightest contradiction and then exploit it. The rule of permanency is also invoked, so any contradiction expressed over time is also pointed out. So something expressed last year that is contradicted today will quickly be brought to the speaker's attention. If nothing else, right man is dependable. If somewhat predictable, this is how he is successful over time. Maybe man, with his pure, poor decision strategy, unreliability and non-commitment over time, tends to be less successful, but he does dream. What right man hears and thus expresses is the significant difference between the maybe man's dream and his actual reality. Right man tends not to be so much of a dreamer. He is rather the doer. Action rarely relies on talking about it endlessly. Just get on with it. So pattern of the end of the matter, finalization. This is easily identified in the right man by a number of catchphrases that all exhibit the same characteristics. The right man has a habit of ending conversations. Given the drivel that he has to listen to, the non-decisions, the ambiguities, the hopeless dreams that he will that will never be actualized and so forth, we should really not be surprised. As in pattern number six, action rarely relies on talking about it endlessly. People just need to get on with it. 
often the right man can hear the lack of ability to be decisive in the logic of the person speaking. The person may be caught in an endless logical loop that doesn't have an exit point, a bit like the yes but what if then loop. And then right man, being decisive, seeks to prevent the speaker from talking to the detriment of himself. So what we have there are a number of um, an other ways of looking at what we see as right man behavior. It's just that the, the context in which the behaviors occur profoundly affects the effect, profoundly affects the effect that the behaviors have. So it all depends on who you are as a recipient of the thing that's happening. So I'm always interested in more data on right man because here's the thing. If I have somebody sitting in front of me as a client who displays these patterns of behavior, I have no hope of being, a, being able to help that person. I certainly know that therapists who attempt to work with narcissists tend to fail. There's not many therapists who, who have either the patience and tolerance um, or the skill set to be able to help narcissists. And as Vaclin points out, I don't even know if narcissists can be changed. They're just acquiring more layering over the top to give themselves greater virtue um, in order to do even more narcissism. So their attempts at change are actually not really attempts at change. They're attempts at acquiring greater control and sophistication in order to get more narcissistic supply. I'm not convinced narcissists are right man and right man is necessarily a narcissist. I'm not convinced on that at all. Um, I think these are a collection of behaviours that pretty much anybody can have. It's just the degree by which they display them would define whether they're a problem or not to other people. Because some people are able to be like this in one context and know to change their behaviours in other contexts. But you see, for some people, that's almost like a betrayal of self. Because if I change who I am across context, then I'm not being authentic and genuine. And so they will take as a point of pride that they will display these behaviours across all contexts and I treat all people equally as a point of pride. And of course, that may well be admirable as a trait, but is it? Um, do we actually require social flexibility, cultural flexibility to change our behaviours according to context and to, to play a better game with other people that brings a lot better feelings? Or should we all be striving for a bold authenticity where we get to say and do whatever we wish because it's authentic to ourselves and other people be damned if they don't like it is that a good position to have i know a number of people who are like that and it seems to work for them it's just that it doesn't work for everyone else around them and since our quality of life does depend on other people it makes sense to me that we learn to get on with other people a little bit better and some of that does involve learning the rules, the cultural rules that other groups have and fitting into those things. As always, do please use the comment section below. Click that like button if you've made it this far because how long we're nearly 40 minutes in. So thank you for watching this far. I do appreciate it. There'll be another video very soon. I wish you all a great New Year's Eve.